For those of you who are joining for the first time today, Third Path is a national nonprofit celebrating our 20th anniversary. And long before others discovered the importance of including men in the work-life integration discussion or the science of work-life integration, we've been showing people how to do work, family, and leadership differently. Did you know that over 71,000 people have checked out our free resources last year? Like the free and recorded versions of our Thursday webinars? We're glad you're here today. And you will quickly discover that today's webinar in some ways summarizes what we've been learning for 20 years and is so appropriate for what too many families are going through right now, which is the pain of trying to do work, family, and manage all the changes that have happened from COVID. So we're really glad you're here today. And you'll see that today's a day where we're gonna really get you, our audience, to be in a part of the conversation and ask us some questions. We did this in July, it worked so well that we are repeating it again in August. And I think what you're gonna see is that all year long, it's our plan to get your involvement and get you some tools that will help you around balancing work, family, and the pandemic. In fact, we've got a pretty amazing event happening in October, um, and we you know, can go to our website to learn more. Um, and we also will have somebody named Salia um, Saliha Baba joining us in uh, December. You'll see that I'm referring to her slides a few times in our call today, and she'll be joining us again personally in December. So I want to give you some background information, and Sally Haas' information, I felt, did a great job of trying to explain when couples are trying to think about work-family balance, especially in a period of stress like the pandemic, it can be challenging. But Sally Haas and her husband, Mark, actually came up a way to visualize what's going on that I think really helps explain. If we're trying to help couples think about this, these visuals, help couples understand what's going on in the dynamics of trying to figure out good solutions. And so Mark is an illustrator and Sally Ha is a therapist, and they came up with this way of describing that what happens between couples, you almost have to think of as a third um, part of their uh, relationship, which is this relationship space between the two people as a couple. And when things are going well, that space, that circle in the middle between the couple can include a lot of excitement and affection and fun and creativity. But as we all have uh, experienced, myself included with my husband, there are times when it doesn't feel that way. And what we're talking about today is when couples get stuck, how to help them get unstuck. And again, Mark and Sally Ha created this great resource um, we'll be referring back to in December with when we have a call with Sally Ha, where they talk about that one reason why that relational space can get complicated um, is because as we go through life, we have experiences, those experiences kind of get stored in our brain as stories and explanations about what happened. And those stories can sometimes influence our present day conversations. And when we get to Catherine Aponte, who's joining us today to talk about her amazing book, um, you'll see that she talks about this as well. And so when we're trying to help couples think about how to think about work, family, and the pandemic, we have to look a little bit about how are they learning to talk to each other and how are they stumbling in that process or being able to stay creative in that process. What I've learned over the last 20 years is that sometimes couples can get stuck in an argument that feels so familiar. And every time they have that discussion, they take off in that same argument faster than you can imagine. And for lack of a better term, we've called it a tango at third pass. It's that kind of heated argument that seems to repeat over and over again. And the point that I've raised by putting these pictures up is that what's really happening at that moment is probably not just an argument about the present, but it's also an argument that includes some of those old stories, maybe even stories that existed before the couple was a couple that are influencing their ability to have a creative conversation and problem solve together. 
they get stuck in an old tango. And again, you'll hear from Sally Hall. She'll talk more about this in December. We've got some great people helping us think about it um, today, not just Catherine Aponte, but a dear friend and therapist, Rachel Allender, who I've known for a very long time, who'll be helping us talk about how to do this differently. How do you step out of a tango? What gets us stuck in a tango? And how can we get smarter as couples? Because what we've really learned at Third Path is once couples get on the same page and kind of can work together around their goals, that it really will help them uh, come up with better and more creative solutions. So again, although not the focus of today's call, Saliha talks about some of these um, approaches to a conversation that can en encourage um, a more creative approach to uh, answers around your work-life balance solution. Um, you know, asking a lot of questions, uh, listening with curiosity, um, considering the context, that's gonna be an important one. You know, depending on your partner's job situation, they might be coming to a conversation around work-life balance that really they're holding on to some information about their job that makes it difficult to meet what you're asking for. But together, the more you understand that context, the more you might be able to come up with a smart solution. So when we're trying to get people to think about work, life, balance, and COVID-19, uh, we're really trying to get them to think about how both parents, whether living together or living apart, are bringing three different things to the equation. How much they can think differently about work, can they redesign it in a way that's a triple win? So look for a way to do their work that's good for their organization, but also good for them and good for their colleagues and clients. So when you're trying to find a better answer, it's a little bit about how you do your work and how both parents can approach their work. It's a little bit about what's happening at home. Can you really figure out a better way to share home responsibilities, whether that's caring for the kids or making meals or grocery shopping or all those other things that need to happen at home? And it's a little bit about where you and your partner both work. Some workplaces, as you've heard on many Thursday webinars, are more supportive of thinking differently around things. Some are pretty work first. You might be working remotely today, but you still are expected to be available Monday through Friday, eight to six for work or even longer. And that makes it pretty hard to find a workable solution and sustainable solution. So that's a little bit about the background. And what we're trying to get you to think about is as a couple, um, as two parents, whether you're living together or apart, can you find a creative answer, a collective vision for where you're going? Can you get on the same page and find a collective vision for where you want to go around work and family? And I've talked about this slide many times. The short point of it is when you have a vision of where you want to go and your current reality is difficult, there can be feelings of sadness, frustration, anger that surface as you're trying to find that answer. And the temptation is to lower your vision. But instead, what today's call about is to say, no, 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 we can help you as a couple create that common vision, create that collective vision, and then work together to reach for that goal. Don't lower the vision, find the common vision and not get stuck in a tango while you're doing it. So it's a big order that we're trying to talk about today, but we have the right experts to get there. All right, to sum up, there's a bunch of things that can get in the way of couples uh, getting to that collective or common vision. Stress, exhaustion, it's been a hard time to get through all this COVID stuff. We don't know what's going on around schools or we do and it's hard. Unsupportive workplaces, financial worries, maybe even some extra stress at home because you're also dealing with elder care. There's a lot going on that can make this really difficult. Today's webinar is about what you have control over. You and your partner have some control to think about a creative answer. And that's what we're gonna be looking at. 
And what our next guest, Catherine Aponte, is going to talk about is how we can sometimes sabotage our own conversations with something she's called as self-protective strategies and how that self-protective strategy can sometimes get in the way of us thinking smarter about what we want to do around work, family, and surviving during COVID. Catherine, I want to thank you so much for being here. We're going to touch on this whole concept of self-protective strategies, but then a little bit later, we're going to get to something you talk about called collaborative negotiation. That's really it, Catherine. We're trying to get people to do collaborative negotiation. And I know you're an expert in this, not because you just teach people how to do this, you've practiced it in your own life. So welcome. And when you've seen what I've said so far and the work that you've done with couples, you know, what's some wisdom you've learned around help, helping couples think about this issues that feels important to share right from the start? Welcome. Oh, we're really glad you're here, Catherine. Oh, thank you so much, Jessica. And I'm really uh, happy to be here and just am just such a great admirer of you personally, as well as the work you've been doing for the last 20 years. And congratulations on your anniversary. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to back up just a tad from the self-protective strategies. Uh, that's the terminology that I prefer instead of defenses, because I think uh, it's uh, self-protective strategies really is what's going on in terms of interacting with other people. It's not just about our own psychology. Uh, but when you talk about tango, when self-protective strategies are operating, it's when a couple is having are, are in a tango instead of what else? Instead of having a, a, a disagreement. Uh, I work a lot and have worked a lot on trying to differentiate between uh, disagreements that couples may have, for example, about what goes into the vision, disagreements about how to manage everyday events, how to manage the household, how to make choices about uh, work and life, work situations. Um, and I differentiate that between conflict or what you are describing as tango. And I spend some time doing that because I think that most uh, uh, professionals, as well as people talking on the on the internet, for example, really confound and confuse those things. And I think it's very different. A discussion is always about the issue at hand. It's about who's doing the dishes, for example, or who's going to take responsibility for the children this week. When you're in conflict with one another, it's never about the issue. It starts with an issue, but it quickly evolves into an issue about who's the better parent, who's the better spouse, who is kinder, who is nicer, who is better than. So it's really becomes a personal issue. And what people get very, conf very confused about sometimes, even the people that advise couples is, once you have moved into tango or conflict and it's about the personal reactions to each other, there is no resolution. There is no way out of that other than self-reflection. And that self-reflection means you have to look at those, you have to be aware of what are your own self-protective strategies that you have developed, as you've said, Jessica, over the years, and perhaps even very early on, you start to develop strategies that morph into adult strategies uh, that we start to defend. You know, yes. usually, go ahead. Oops. No, no, no. My, my, screen, my screen changed and I. <laughs> oh, well, you're, you're right on target. And, and, and just to emphasize what Catherine's talking about, I, and that's one of the many things I loved about her book. And by the way, when you see uh, the next slide, you'll see that actually, thanks to Catherine, we've got 10 free books to give away and a little <laughs> message about how you can get them. So this is an awesome book. And Catherine did an amazing job in so many ways. And right from the start, she's nailed it because there's a huge difference between a disagreement and a conflict. And where we saw couples getting in trouble was this conflict where it suddenly got very heated very quickly and very repetitive. And so thank you for getting to that. And, and again, what you taught us in that book, and you've taught me from knowing you for a long time, and you'll see that Rachel uses very similar language, 
that these conflicts or tangos, we can get smarter than them, we can step out of them, but it takes some self-reflection. And so let's talk about this self-protective strategies. Interestingly, in a conversation that I had with Rachel a long, long time ago, she used to refer to it as scaffolding. As human beings, we grow up in an environment where maybe a lot of things are going well, but some things are challenging, and so we kind of build some scaffolding around us to make it all work. And, you know, we have did it for a good reason. Um, and, and so both parents are coming to a relationship with these self-protective strategies, this scaffolding around them. However, unfortunately, it's the part that we don't even know we're doing. We don't even see it there, and it can kind of uh, continue to create problems um, around how to have a creative conversation. I want to give a personal example of a self-protective strategy, but then I really want Catherine to go ahead and tell us more about this, just to get it concrete with people. I put perfectionism at the top. <laughs> I don't know whether uh, my family members would call me a perfectionist or controlling or, you know, there's some word that would come out. Um, very organized, that would be the way I would call myself. I'm very organized. Um, but really what's going on is, um, you know, my rationale is I, I like to be organized. I like to things get the things done the right way. But if you scratch the surface and you have a kind of personal conversation with me and I'm willing to admit it a little bit, you know, I'm pretty scared of doing something wrong. And that comes from a long, long time ago. Anybody want to have a conversation with me, email me and you and I can talk about these self-protective strategies and I can tell you where that comes from. But it ain't to do with my marriage. It ain't to do with Jeffrey and me. It's something that happened a long, long time ago. So I wanted to give that as an example. Um, but Catherine, tell us more about these self-protective strategies and how they contribute to conflicts and tangos. Okay. Uh, Jesse, that was a perfect example. And I think the uh, heading over interpersonal goal, what what I mean by that is uh, that's what interpersonally you're trying to avoid yep. having to deal with being corrected. Yep. So, uh, and just to back up just one second, one of the other ways that you know that you're in tango uh, versus when you're having a disagreement is you will not describe the situation uh, or what your partner is doing. You will characterize what he is doing. He is being uh, like if you're in a perfectionist, you're you're standing in my way, you're not helping me, you're working against me. All yeah. kinds of things that personally go after the your spouse personally, not describing. Look, when this happens, when X, Y, and Z happens, I feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think that you just you just summarized it quite perfectly. Withdrawal is when we talk about people withdrawing um, and sometimes your spouse will, you or your spouse will just shut down and not talk to you. And the rationale for that in the interpersonal rationale is, well, I'm just a quiet person. But what it is, is what can be behind it is a longstanding fear of getting run over, of, of not being taken seriously, not being, not feeling important. So the, quote, the, the issue about this self-protective strategy or defensive is to know when that is happening so that you can step back and reflect. You cannot get out of this in, an, in, a, in a relationship by talking more. You have to stop and step yeah. back. And yeah. the clue is often some kind of feeling that you're having, tenseness, anxiety, fearful, anger, whatever. That's a good, that, Plus, when you start characterizing some your spouse, not describing what's going on, that's a those are the red flags that tell you, uh oh, I'm in my self protective mode. I need to stop, take some time out, step back, and take a look at what's going on. Yeah. And again, in the in the book, just for a plug, <laughs> the yeah. book I really describe a number of ways that you can do that, and I'm sure Rachel will also be describing some of the ways you can get yourself out of that. Yes, I, that's what's great about this book is it really does go into the nitty gritty of some ideas about how you and your partner can kind of really approach things differently and get to that creative space, that place where there's collaborative negotiation going on. So we are going to get to that uh, for sure. 
Rachel, again, you know, you've known me in and out for a long time. We are very good friends. Uh, you're also an expert like Catherine in working with couples on these things. I'm so glad you're here. And I know that as you've been listening in, a lot has probably triggered uh, your thoughts as well. What would you like to share of, or, around your work with couples or anything that you've seen around this tango, et cetera? Sure. I think that what you've covered so far is very important. And what I want to build on is protective, um, self-protective strategies protect the weaknesses that we have, right? Like we all have strengths and weaknesses, right? Yeah. And so they're built up. Um, we even in gestalt therapy call them creative adjustments sometimes too, to to mm-hmm. guard against the parts that we aren't strong in. And I think that one of the <clears throat> important things for couples to do is to really be able to see their partner them, in themselves what their strengths and weaknesses are and what their partner's strengths and weaknesses are so that they can work with that so that when you when you get back to um that holding the vision right and yep. and the creative vision that you're actually not sort of giving up oh well you're weak in this way so i have to accommodate in this other way i give up and i'm going to give a quick example if i can i've been Please. working with a couple for some long time and we know that he, uh one partner has um adhd and is medicated for it working on it has therapy and um but what what happened was really interesting. We've been working for some long time, but in session this week, um, she says we have to get ready for this transition to fall. We have all these things we have to do to get the two little kids ready for fall. And he says, sort of laughing, well, you, like when you come to me and say interrupt what I'm doing and say that we need to do this it's really hard for me. I, I, can, I can't pull myself away from the other thing. And he laughs. And I see her just like crumple because she's thinking, okay, I'm not going to fight with him. I'm just going to do it all myself. And I'm overwhelmed. Right. Mm. And, and I said, well, I said, but I, I think that what's missing there is that the, the, the knowledge and good intention. So I said to him, wait a minute, I know you have been doing, you've been really sharing care with this partner all this time. What, what do you like? What's, what's going on and so what what came out through the work was he's getting clear that actually when he's focused highly focused with his adhd mind in one place he's really great at getting something done when he's pulled away from that it feels quite violent it's like this it's is he feels spun in a spun house right Mm -hmm. and so when we when we um when we were eight, when I was able to help him say, no, no, I, I want to help you. You know, I'm not laughing. He said, you're laughing because you're embarrassed, <laughs> not because you don't want me. Mm-hmm. Because right? mm-hmm. it's embarrassing and shameful mm-hmm. that you can't change. Mm-hmm. Your... So there's just this way in which when we got there to, okay, she says, well, wait a minute, but here's the problem. You always tell me to remind you, but now that's the worst job on earth. Mm-hmm. If I remind you, I'm the person who puts you in the fun house. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so seeing this is not the answer, but seeing that, oh, here's the problem. Now there's compassion now mm-hmm. there's between the couple. And when you get that compassion and care, now we can look at what, what are the ways that we can, that this mutual goal can be met, which is that the kids have what they need for fall and that the two of them do it together. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that is such a a wonderful example. And oops, I I want to go to the, I guess I put that. I want to go to this one again because I, again I I think it's that you know listen with curiosity, um, stay playful, hold uncertainty, ask questions. It's that it's that more open ended place that you you know instead of jumping into the tango together, you're yeah. you're using some of these tools to stay open to the possibility that you both really could figure this out together. And I would open up and say, when I looked at this list, I was thinking, where does this story fit? And consider context. I think there's the context of people's jobs, but there's also the reality of their internal worlds. What are, what yes. are, who am I? What am I? Who am my partner? Exactly. Yeah. And that's what you get to this to this circle here, which is very helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and also. Um, you know, I like your use of the concept of strength and weakness because I'm sure everybody listening in today can imagine that they chose their partner, um, you know, assuming they're still married, uh, they chose their partner. Um, in some ways, they probably chose that partner because they actually had a, an opposite, something in them that they did that's very different than you. And together, it's a great combined strength. Um, again, you know, in our household, 
yeah, in our household, a classic example is I'm a planner, Jeff's more spontaneous. And it turns out for families to function well, you need both. You can't just plan away family and you can't just be spontaneous with family. And so, you know, now celebrating our 30th anniversary this month, um, we've learned how to do a little bit of both, you know? So, Rachel, I want to talk to you about this slide for a second, and um, and then we're going to get back to Catherine and talking about how we can use collaborative negotiation to think about these issues um, together. Um, you know, so you've worked with me a long time. Uh, you know, one of the things we're trying to communicate is that all of these issues can be challenging. Work, home and workplace. And so we can be arguing about sharing things at home, but it might turn out that what's happening in the workplace is influencing that problem even more than what's happening at home. When you work with couples, any thoughts or stories about how all three of these things can kind of be pulled apart or influence each other? And, you know, any, any thoughts that come to mind around this? Sure, I'm gonna just use the same couple for a moment because yeah. again, I, there's like they have, like, where they are now is with such good intention and they've demonstrated throughout the pandemic actually the ability at the beginning to flat both of them to be very flexible to try and accommodate right mm -hmm. but as interestingly as work now is this kind of movement in this period of, of pandemic to kind of autumn and um get quote unquote getting back to some normal right like mm -hmm more attentively or you know um children getting more education whether it's at full time at home or hybrid or whatever um i think what was interesting is of course he is being pulled back to work in a very big way right like work and yep. he's a leader at work and he's let a lot of things slide for the whole organization and now some of them are biting yeah right really are they truly are so it was an interesting piece about how then the the weakness gets plays out worse, right? Like, cause the distractions happening at work and the distractions happening at home. So I think that, um, I think that what's really important here, um, we've talked about in some of the workshops we've done, the bigger workshops is, is North Star. Mm -hmm. And so session, what I did was I didn't get into debating or haggling. I just said, wait a minute, you, you guys do this together and you value it, right? We already determined that, that you want to take care of your home together, you want enough time for work. Nothing's gonna be perfect right now, but just to, to help people start, I think couples need to say, again, what is it we're aiming for? Mm -hmm. Like what's our, back to your earlier slide, what's our vision? Yep, and yep. If you don't remind yourself of the vision, then you then you then you quickly cave and you don't stay with the creative tension because his vision is not for his partner because she's stronger at worrying and remembering all the details to do them all right okay right and and actually they did in the session he was able to say god the way i'm so freaked out when i get pulled away you're freaked out all the time because every detail is with you every minute you're struggling mm. every minute like they have mm. empathy for each other, right mm -hmm. but again to get to get to a solution that's satisfying requires knowing what the vision is and yeah. and, and and back to that together before yeah, you start to yeah, i'll tell you, you what other, one other secret ingredient i hear in your story you know some couples can come to this fairly easily some need support um yeah. and and some can do it on their own but it it just takes a while so i remember uh we had a webinar where one of our parents in our community was talking about how it took them a year of doing a lot of listening and trying not to get into tangos but just learning together until they finally could come to some answers so it's a it's a, it can be a a slow process to make this change happen and you might need support because it might be that you get stuck in those tangos and they're just so difficult that you actually need a Rachel or a Catherine or somebody in the, in the third path community or somewhere else to help you make the change. So, so as you're listening in today, don't think this is a quick, quick solution. This is a, a lifetime solution that you're committing to and what Rachel talked about, you're getting clear about what your North Star is. We're gonna talk more about that a little bit later. What is it you both are reaching for and how do you keep on moving towards that? In fact, the very next slide um, is going back to uh, Catherine's book. Um, again, there were many things I liked about Catherine's book. 
Um, and one of the things, of course, that made me happy is that she's really talking about collaborative negotiation. The idea that our relationship is a healthy, becomes a healthy place because couples learn how to do collaborative negotiation. And I would argue that Jeff and I can celebrate 30 years together because we got good at <laughs> collaborative negotiation. Right. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about that. And thank you for having a book that couples can turn to and learn more about this. Tell, tell us what is collaborative negotiation and how are these yeah. points I played out important at some okay. point, tell that too. Congratulations on 30 years and here's <laughs> to the next 30. Yeah, Joe and, I, Joe and I just celebrated 60, by the way. Fabulous, fabulous. Uh, woo -hoo. Yeah, <laughs> woohoo is right. Uh, exhausting. <laughs> no, it's been wonderful. Um, collaborative negotiate. I worked on that a long time to figure out how to think about and how to talk about the kind of relationship that was really vital and vibrant and sustainable and allowed people to create, as you say, the vision of what their, their marriage is supposed to be like, what their marital goals are, and how to do that as long as, and also take into account individual goals. And the reason that I all focused on collaborative negotiation, I wanna talk about collaboration and negotiation in a minute, is because we, had to, to, we have to find a, a, a way to think about being married other than in a gender, format mode. Uh, there was a woman years ago who talked about marriage being a gender factory, mm -hmm. that uh, she was studying uh, the distribution of responsibilities in the household. And her conclusion was that it was much more about creating gender than it was about getting tasks done. Mm -hmm. So that I've been working for the 30 to 40 years of my career to find a, a better way to talk about how we can be together. And I've come up with negotiation, but it it is a, not the typical kind of negotiation. It's not, as we all know now, the concept of quid pro quo. It's not a transaction. It's not a tit for tat. And that's why we have to think about it as collaborative. And that is how do we work collaboratively, collaboratively together, not in exchange, but to, to come to, um, I talk about it as a win-win solution. I think yours is a better one. Uh, uh, it's all right, triple, triple win, it's more focused on the work side, but you're looking for yeah. that answer. That's, that's right, well, but your right. terminology was better, but win-win solutions to issues that arise yeah. and keeping them again as issues, not as conflict. But first, there are just a list of things that, that are, you have a wonderful slide here, but also is in the book. Be sure to know how your perspe what perspective you're presenting and how to describe it. And explaining why what you prefer. Uh, in the book, I'm just going to do a little bit of plug for this. I really don't talk about needs. Needs are not things you can negotiate. Needs are things you can only, only uh, transact. So uh, I prefer the idea of I have wants and wishes and preferences about things that, ref that are of value to me in the world. Uh, I want to be able to express those preferences. And I want to give my partner the opportunity to express his views as well. And, uh, and if you do that, there is this wonderful outcome, at least it is in our, my marriage, is we really gain respect and interest in our partner because they are able to express things that I don't think and that I don't always take into account. And it's so it's a whole new experience about them, but it's also a new experience about different ways of being in the world. And you, we always, because we're human beings and because we are vulnerable, and as Rachel says, because we have our own weaknesses, you always have to be alert to what's going on emotionally when you're having these, when you're trying to negotiate issues, important issues like kids going to school, does somebody take a new job, et cetera, is when you start getting those tense feelings, anxious, angry, miffed, pissed, pedo, et cetera, <laughs> step back, stop and step back, collect yourself. Where are you? What's going on with me? Do I need to take a, a couple of minutes off to relocate myself so that I can come back into the negotiation as a open, full participant? Wonderful. I love that word, open, full participant. 
Um, because again, and as, as Catherine has said so well, you, you know, you probably picked your partner for very good reasons and they are going to bring some other ways of approaching things that can really make a better solution together. Um, and, you know, and if you have that North Star of what you're reaching for, um, I guarantee you will keep on using collaborative negotiation again and again and again. So with, there's lots more we could say about every single one of these slides, but we want to make sure we get to a point where you can ask us some questions about this and get Catherine's expertise to answer that question or Rachel's expertise. So I'm going to go through a couple more things and then we're going to get you to send in your questions in the chat box. So write them down. Uh, start thinking about what you want to ask us because you've got some really smart people, as you can see today, to help you figure out how to take that next step towards creating a real partnership at home where you're both reaching for what we're going to call this North Star. So the North Star is going to reflect a little bit about how you want to set things up at home. You know, for me and Jeffrey, it was really important to have a team approach. As our kids' needs change, they got a little older. We needed to uh, really think differently about different solutions. And as we go through COVID, I've heard over and over again how much this idea of creating a schedule where you know what's going on and the kids know what's going on. So, you know, your teenager knows to ask dad when dad's in charge um, and you when you're in charge. Um, but it's also a little bit about your North Star is a little bit about what's happening at work um, and your ability to kind of communicate with your manager about, hey, on Thursdays, I'd really like to set it up so that I don't work because that's my day to be fully in charge of the kids and do the do the online learning that we're doing. Um, but you know what? Uh, we can kind of coordinate all of our meetings on a different day. So as you're looking for your North Star, it's a little about what you want from home, a little about what you want from work. You're putting it all together into that combined goal that you both are reaching for about how you're approaching work, how you're approaching home, and you're giving it that context to the workplace that you work in. Um, and that's gonna help you define. So for example, some people's North Star might be, um, you know, to have just one parent be in charge right now at home and the other parent working. Um, I was somewhere um, this summer where someone was still able to use um, their full-time nanny. And so they both were able to work in a, um, even though they were working remotely, they were both working kind of normal hours. So your North Star like, might look very different, but the idea is that the two of you together kind of help define this North Star. I'm going to say one last thing um, before we get closer and closer to the question time. Um, it doesn't have to be two parents living at home who figure out a common North Star. If you listen to our July webinar, one of our experts who was answering questions, Bryn Jones, I asked her to share a little bit of her story. And she and her ex-husband um, have, have a way that they share the care of their children, even though they are separated and divorced. So you can really find an answer uh, when you have a good ability to think creatively with your partner or even your ex-partner um, on how to do these things. All right, so we're almost at the point where we wanna ask you guys some questions. Um, there might be one last thought you want to share, Rachel, before we get to questions, and then I'm going to ask Catherine the same thing, and then we're going to open it up for questions. It looks like we might even have some questions already, which is great. Rachel, anything else you want to add, and then I'll ask Catherine the same thing. Yeah, I do want to amplify what um, what Catherine said about creating gender mm -hmm. and about collaborating, and I think it's mm -hmm. really important because, and it's interesting, I used a male-female um, couple, but. Um, what I sometimes say to people is, okay, so imagine you live alone. These are still your children and this is still your house. What's gonna happen now? Like what's gonna happen? And I don't mean it because I'm threatening them with separating. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying like, if you're in charge because that you are, you are, how are you gonna do this? Like what, yeah. what are you gonna, what's gonna be important? And so I just wanna say that I think that, that um, helping people um, really collaborate and re re recognize that this is not for somebody else this is like something they figure out together and also just that the preferences really is an important um really unpacking what your preference really is so that it's not just a reconstruction of gender it's not this kind of fantasy of preference but it's actually you're getting to your real preferences is important yeah 
Yeah, uh, we will make sure we talk some more about the North Star. And I love this whole concept of marriage can be a gender factory and how can we step out of that? Uh, that's really a, a great way to think about some of this stuff. Thanks for coming back to that, Rachel. Catherine, there might be one more thing you want to say, and it looks like we do have some questions that Melissa will share with us in a second. What's your last thought, Catherine, before we hear the questions? My one more thing in the way that the, the reason I originally be, got involved with Third Path is about shared care. Sharing care, however you work that out, but that it is a joint effort and not a gendered effort, has been so important to me because as a person, as a woman who really grew up and raised my children in the 70s, and we were both in school and seeking careers, we had horrible child care. And that is painful. It was painful then, and it's painful now to know that I was not able, and my husband and I were not able to provide the best care that we could for our children. So shared care, everybody, shared care. <laughs> yeah, and whatever that looks like, it could be as simple as- That's right, that's yeah, right. You know, both parents working a four day work week or both you know, dividing up the week, where there's like a thousand examples of, you know, childcare can be, when we have childcare again, it could be an important resource, but you know, again, we're kind of dealing with this crazy COVID world right now, and that's, the last thing I wanted to say is that, you know, we want to get your questions and we will have this event in October, our parents forum, where we talk a lot about all this stuff. And then we actually have a, a work breakout group where it helps you define your North Star. Um, so we are all year long. We want to have some resources for you guys to figure this out and keep on figuring this out. Melissa, it looks like we might have some questions. Um, you want to tell us what our what first question you want to share with us? Sure, uh, we've got one question from a participant that asks, um, how do you deal with a partner who has trouble expressing themselves and communicating um, and identifying their emotions? Oh, thank you. That is probably a question that a lot of people have. I'm gonna start with Rachel. Can you share a couple of thoughts about that? And Catherine, I know you have some thoughts about that too. So Rachel, what, what are some um, ideas you have for that? And then listeners, please, Send us your questions. Where are you struggling? What would you like to learn about? Uh, this is really a call to help you. Rachel, your thoughts. So I think there are some muscles that have to get strengthened for a person mm -hmm. who needs to be able to communicate their feelings. Um, if that's not, if that, if their strategies for survival in their family of origin or somewhere along the way, they learn to like kind of shut that off to some degree. And so I, my sense is that there needs to be conversations about feelings, not while you're working on the, on the di difference. Mm. You mm. have to practice it at a time that isn't hot when you're, mm -hmm. when you're, uh, your um, cortisol is low and you're, um, and you're more open, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. one advice is that, that you practice build. I really say to people, you have to build your muscles. You mm -hmm. can't use the muscles you haven't built. So mm -hmm. if you don't have a good vocabulary for talking about how you're feeling and what's going on for you, Doing it when you're anxious and feeling defensive isn't going to be the time when you're going to do it well, mm -hmm. right? You're going to mm -hmm. practice doing it at other times. Mm -hmm. Very, very creative. Very creative. Catherine, what comes to your mind around this issue? Uh, first and foremost, what comes to mind is this a self-protective strategy? You know, mm -hmm. is this person uh, resistant in some way, fearful, uh, and and you will not be able to know that as a spouse. I mean, you, you will likely have guesses about it, uh, which you cannot, in fact, offer as an explanation or offer as a way to try to induce them to, to become more self-reflective. And the issue is that partner has to become more self-reflective and make that commitment to doing that. And the only way that I know how to do that with and stay out of a tango, stay out of a conflict yeah. at the same time is to step back be clear, it's almost like you have to do with somebody who is an alcoholic. You don't address the alcoholism, you don't address what, you, what you're identifying as a problem. You say, in this situation, when you don't speak up or are unable to speak up, this is the impact on me. I can't do anything about that. My hope for you, it, but, and then you simply, and then you have to say, it does have an effect on the quality of a relationship. I will do my part. My hope is that you will do yours. So you simply describe the impact of the behavior on yourself 
rather than trying to identify what is going on and that's wrong with your partner and what he or she should do about it. Mm. That, that never works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the book, I do use that model of, um, of, uh, of alcoholism as a way of addressing, for example, there's a chapter in the book on how to deal with a mentally ill person. And uh, so it's a similar kind of thing, not that the person is mentally ill, but if there is a is a is an issue, this is a good strategy to try to use to get them to, to take on the responsibility of doing something different about it as they define what that should be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, wow. And again, I, I think this is, this can be, I mean, I think we started right off with a very good question that I think some people probably struggle with. Um, there's something Bridget Schulte said a long time ago when we were mm -hmm. talking about tangos um, that, that I think is a great way to, to shorten the equation. She said, you know, you know, that couples can get into a certain dance, A plus B equals C. And then she said, you only need to change A, the one person, to change the outcome to be C prime. So in other words, if I, A prime, change myself, even if the other person doesn't change, I can still get a different outcome. So I'm imagining this came up because you know, you're getting into a tango. This person shuts down, you can't really have a conversation and it feels like a really repetitive, frustrating situation. And what I've learned for myself, because believe it or not, Jeff and I have had many a tangos, is if I find someone who can listen to me and I can tell that person how angry I am about how it's being so redundant and it's happening every time, then when I come back to Jeff, I can be more relaxed and I can listen better and I can do what Catherine's asking me to do. I can say, honey, when you are so quiet, I have all kinds of stories in my head about what's going on and I don't feel like we're getting to an answer and I'm doing my best here to try to figure this out. But I, you know, but, but in other words, to vent somewhere else and come back to the conversation with a little bit more curiosity again, a little bit more, um, openness to context and learning. Um, there might be a one last thought that uh, either Rachel or Catherine wants to say about that topic. Otherwise, I'm gonna go to Melissa and see if there's another question. Any last thoughts, Rachel or Catherine? Um, I, you know, I, I think that it, it is what you just said about, you know, going like having someone else listen to you. I think that having resource, having um, su a support network, like when, when um, at a Jewish wedding, you have a chuppah, and um, it's open on all four sides. And one of the reasons it's open on all four sides is because even though you're building a home for the couple and their, and their children who might come if they do, you're also not closing it off to the community because mm -hmm. you're gonna need that community to support you. Yeah. And so I think that whether you have somebody who can call to listen to you, whether you get a therapist, you know, th but that, that you find that, that everybody needs support, right? Yes. And support. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think the team has to go bigger than just the two. Yeah, yeah, to, and to really normalize that, I, Jeff and I definitely reached out to um, people at, uh, and, and professionals at different points in our lives, and we we saw ourselves getting some stuck on some things, and and uh, it it became a very good tool for us to know that we could reach out and get extra support. Um, Catherine, there might be one last uh, thought you want to share before we hear from another question. No, just ditto consultation. <laughs> yes, it it really proves very helpful to to get to where we are in these long longer term relationships. Um, Melissa, there might be another question. And even if there isn't, I have some ideas of what we could talk about, but there might be another question. Uh, we actually have two more questions and we're down Great. to about five more minutes. Uh, Rachel okay. had mentioned that she's got a hard stop at two. So Great. Great. Uh, let me share one. Um, how do you talk about the gendered nature of our marriage that is um, both true to me and my truth, but doesn't make my husband feel attacked? Any talk of privilege, emotional labor, childcare ends badly. Oh gosh. So this okay. is a powerful question we could use all five minutes to talk about, and it's such a good one. Just give us a hint what the next question is so we know. Um, how do you deal with gender stereotypes from employers, <laughs> meaning that the expectation is uh, leave and care is the responsibility of the woman? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you uh, for asking. I'm glad we put that on the table because you have to remember what's happening at home is in part because of what's happening at work. And how do we how do we disconnect all of that? I'm going to get Rachel first to share her thoughts, then Catherine and Rachel. If you have to step off at promptly at, at that time, that's fine. Um, but do remember, you need to separate the work influences from the life 
and home influences. And what we've learned in 20 years is if the couple can get smart about what they want at home, they can push back even in an unsupportive workplace. So the place to begin is at home. And yes, there's too many workplaces that reinforce gendered roles that create problems at home. Rachel, what advice do you have to the, that gender, how it plays out um, at home and how to help yeah. couples around that? So I think that what what the what the questioner is at is raising is the way in which when you raise how it feels to you, it can become shaming for the other person. Mm -hmm. And I think because they feel equally in a bind. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it, it that what has to happen is to see um, see the structure like page see patriarchy as harming men and women, mm -hmm. right? It's really important for couples to say, how is this structure harming you and how is it harming me? Mm -hmm. And so if you want your partner not to be defensive, you might start with, how is it harming you? And again, I had a couple where early in therapy, they came in and he was sort of saying, I don't have time to take care of my kids essentially. Mm -hmm. And we looked at him and said, there are 18 summers and then they're gone. And that, you know, and we're already at summer number four. Mm -hmm. And he broke down weeping because yeah. the truth is he is missing out if he's not participating and caring for his own child in a way that yeah. he feels. Okay. So I think though that um, sometimes the truth is that's when, when people get really roadblocked around this, sometimes they do need a therapist to help and you need to find a good person who understands this stuff and doesn't also reconstruct it. Um, but but it but but really it's about seeing it as a shared problem again, that that the gendered nature of things is a is a is a problem that's harming everybody. It's harming the yeah. kids, it's harming the husbands, it's harming the wives. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. having me on this call. Sorry that I have to jump off. I'll listen for two minutes and then I'm going to disappear. I'm Thanks. so glad you were here. Um, wonderful Bye, comments Rachel. on that, Catherine. What would you like to uh, add to uh, this question about uh, gender? Well, these questions are actually so close to my heart. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And yes. it really is uh, much of why I wrote this book. Is is uh, I really do love that notion of marriage as a gender factory, and it's very difficult to work against this. And again, uh, most of the time we want to just try to inform our spouses, and particularly husbands. I think it's most often the case because it is assumed that uh, these gender differentiation, gender roles uh, create a better advantage for husbands, particularly in the home, uh, the diff gender differentiation. And again, it's very difficult to uh, inform them that you can't give them books, you, can't, you cannot talk to them about privilege because, now I did read a recent article that says, use the concept of advantage. Uh, I do think some of this has to come from uh, men themselves. Uh, I just wrote a, an article on, uh, I do a blog on psychology today, and I had read this wonderful <laughs> blog about a husband who got divorced, his wife divorced him because he left uh, glass by the dish, dishwasher and didn't put it in. But it was a wonderful article. And he's consulting with men because men don't read, for example, the five languages of love. So uh, again, I go back to that approach, and I think, and I talk about it in the book, go back to that approach of really laying out the implication of the unawareness of, on your part, on the part of your partner of taking and looking at things through a gender perspective. And uh, repeatedly saying that, and if that does not yield anything, and you still feel that sense of dissatisfaction, I do think you have to get some outside consultation for yeah. that. But yeah. start with that notion of getting your own reaction out because it's very difficult not to react strongly emotionally and 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 uh, participate and helping to create a conflict and just stepping back and being very descriptive, you know, go and read about the difference between characterizing somebody as a well, I can't say, I was going to say a bad word, but I won't say a bad word. Uh, <laughs> parenting your spouse in some negative way versus yep. describing what they do 
and what the impact of that is on you. And then and only then perhaps you can try to frame it within a gender structure. Yeah. But stay yeah. concrete, stay descriptive, say this is the impact on me and leave it at that. Now, if that doesn't yield results, then I think you have to say, this has become a problem. I do not believe we can resolve this. I want to go and seek some consultation. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, from the lens of that this is because I, I believe in our relationship, I believe in us figuring this out and you know, getting some support. There's a lot of uh, good, good support out there that can help couples think smarter, as you can hear from today's uh, webinar. So, and we also really see this year, and I want to emphasize that this is a year where we want to help, 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 help you guys who are listening in today. Um, please, the Parents Forum is all about this on, in October. It's going to be a chance. We've kind of broken it up into two half uh, days with the idea that you're balancing a heck of a lot this year. Um, and so you can kind of join us for these two half day experiences, and they will really help you start defining your North Star stepping out of gender roles and instead stepping into the roles that you both are really happy with and can keep on uh, collaboratively negotiating around as work and life continue to shape uh, the way you uh, build your lives together. So we're really sorry we're out of time, um, but what great questions, what a great thing that we got to how gender can really play uh, uh, some tricks for us but there really are some answers. And my hope is that you will keep on listening into these webinars as a way to get some resource. All of our webinars from last year are up on our website, um, including the one that we just did last month where we talk about how to kind of create a more sustainable solution um, and finding recharge time, even during the time of COVID for families. Um, and you know, I really want to thank you guys for being here today. Thank you, Catherine, for being here. That was really wonderful. I really appreciate your uh, involvement today. Thanks, Catherine. I, I would just, uh, if people really want to, I write a lot about gender and various issues, and um, I do. I have a blog both on uh, the think you have advertised, but also in in Psychology Today. You can go onto Psychology Today blogs and just write. Uh, type in my name and you can take a look at some of the, I, I think I've written about 34, 35 posts. So yes. take a look at those, they might be helpful to you. And I would highly recommend them. I've been uh, thinking about how we want to start including some of them in our newsletter because they're really well written, get right to the heart of the issue. Oh, so please, thank you, Jessica. No, please do uh, take a look at that. So thank you everybody for being part of today's webinar. I hope you got some of your questions answered. Um, I hope you'll write in um, and give us a, a shout out for one of those free copies of Catherine's book. Um, and I hope you'll tune back uh, when we start our new season of webinars in October. Thanks for being here today.